station. This is Houston. Are you ready for the event? Houston, station is ready. University of New Mexico, this is Mission Control Houston. Please call station for a voice check. Station, this is University of New Mexico. How do you hear me? Hello to the University of New Mexico. The International Space Station has you loud and clear. Woo! <laughs> Hello, Christina. We have over 600 students here at the University of New Mexico and more online. Our co-host will also broadcast nationwide uh, on the Children's Hour radio show. We have some great questions for you and we hope our samples from the first advanced plant habitat experiment are still frozen up there. Welcome on board to all 600 of you and everyone else who's watching. Yes, I think your samples are somewhere on board in one of our freezers, and I'm looking forward to your great questions today. Hi, I'm Bianca Cerda, an undergraduate at the University of New Mexico. We saw a tool designed by college students, was recently used in a spacewalk. How can college students contribute to NASA mission? Hi, Bianca, great question. Yes, you are right. The tool that you're talking about is actually right here, and it's what we call a zip tie cutter. And it was used in a series of recent spacewalks that we did to repair an instrument that resides on the external part of station that's called the alpha magnetic spectrometer. And it's a really exciting astrophysics experiment that is seeking to understand more about dark matter, antimatter, and other really exciting cosmological things. This zip tie cutter was designed by students um, from Lone Star College. And the unique thing about it is that not only does it cut the zip ties that are a part of that instrument, but it, cap it captures them afterwards so that they don't become space debris or space trash or get in the way of the rest of the, EVA, the spacewalk. Um, it is, it's definitely an exciting thing to be a part of because the alpha magnetic spectrometer was never actually designed to be repaired on orbit during a spacewalk. So the contributions of students to things like this and making unique tools to get the job done was absolutely essential in making sure that the AMS can continue its awesome scientific work. This particular program was um, part of the Artemis Student Challenge, and it was called Micro-G Next. So that's just one of the many ways that college students can get involved. Another way that you can get involved is by doing internships or co-ops with NASA or seeing the other um, partnerships that are available through your university. I know when I was in college, I got involved with NASA because I was a space geek even back then uh, through something called the Space Grant Consortium. So there's a variety of ways that you too can get involved in human space flight and with NASA or space science or earth science missions that NASA does. Hi, I'm Maya Falcon and I'm a sixth grader at Bosque School. We are here because of work by UNM biologists in the advanced plant habitat. What plant experiments are you doing in space right now? Well, I tell you what, we actually just just finished up a round of three different harvests on our recent um, garden in space. We grew Mizuna lettuce plants and we got to eat them here on board, half of the harvest anyway. The other half we're going to send down to the ground so that the scientists can continue their evaluation. But right here, you can actually see the facility where the plants were growing. It's like a little mini greenhouse built into an electronics and um, scientific experiment locker as we call it here in space. And I also have something to show you, which is how we physically grow the plants. So this is what we call a plant pillow. And it, encased in it is the soil equivalent that has all the nutrients and fertilizers that we're evaluating in this experimental facility. Um, we also have a really unique way of watering these plants. We do it through a tube, and that's because obviously we can't just pour water onto the plants like you can in gravity. And we have to have a special way to keep the um, water away from the roots so that the, they don't actually completely encapsulate the roots and prevent the roots from doing what they need to do. So that was an exciting experiment. Now, one thing that it differs um, from the advanced plant habitat 
facility that I think your biology department used was it sounded like yours was a much more automated system, whereas the, the veggie system that we used more recently was very crew intensive. We were involved in physically watering the plants, monitoring the plants, harvesting, trimming, and, you know, taking, taking stock of how healthy they were doing, whether they needed more or less water just by observing. Um, and we did that with help with the ground, whereas we weren't fully instrumented and um, automated like some other facilities. So there's kind of two different ways to, to do that and to take on that challenge of growing food in space. Hello, I'm Julia Wolf, a 14-year-old. When the astronauts were working on UNM plant experiments in the advanced plant habitat, they seemed to be very happy. Do you think plants are more important for nutrition or psychological benefit? You know what, I am absolutely sure that they were very happy working on your plants because I know how much I enjoyed working on the plants during my mission. And I can tell you, I don't think it's possible to pick just one. I think the value of growing things in orbit is both psychological and, you know, for food and nourishment. I think we get a lot out of seeing something grow and a reminder of earth and even just the smell of the plants can be something so unique up here and something to all take pride in, to enjoy together. So, um, you know, seeing the plants grow, being a part of it, creating something, but also the crew aspect, getting together for a unique meal, getting to eat the salad and things like that is another aspect of um, how wonderful it is. So there's just not enough I, good I can say about it. And we're so grateful that programs like yours get to participate and sort of move that that science on the frontiers border forward and forward as we learn how we can be more sustainable for long duration space flight missions. Have you ever tried a New Mexico chili and will you be able to roast chilies on the space station? Luckily for me, I have tried a New Mexico chili, and it they're awesome. Um, the chili sauces there are second to none for sure. In fact, a little story about that. I was trying to think when was the last time I had a Mexico, uh, New Mexico chili, and it reminded me of a great memory. When I first got the job as an astronaut, I actually had to take a road trip all the way from where I was living in Montana down to Houston. And sure enough, I have some friends that live in Santa Fe, and I stopped in to see them, and we all went out for some authentic New Mexican food and of course that included chili sauce. So I was just recently emailing with those friends and they asked me that very same question if we have chilies on board and I said you have no idea how much I wish we did because they are wonderful and I sure do miss that. In terms of roasting them I'm not sure. I, we do actually have the chance to roast garlic here sometimes. Uh, we have a little space oven. It doesn't get very hot but if you put some things in there and you wrap them up real tight you can cook them for long enough that you can get that kind of roasted feel so hey I'm willing to try I wish I was gonna be here for it what's the best way to describe microgravity is it as fun as we imagine I think the best way to describe it is that what it means is that you and all of your surroundings are in free fall. So what it appears as if everything just floats in place, but really you're all just accel accelerating and free falling around the Earth. So we are experiencing the Earth's gravity. In fact, we're actually experiencing about 90% of what you all experience on the surface of the Earth. The difference is we're just moving so fast that as we fall, we actually fall around the Earth. Earth, and that defines orbit. So microgravity means we're not, you know, it's not the absence of mass, which of course creates gravity, but all the objects together are in the same gravitational field and all falling together. So yes, it is a lot of fun. Um, floating around, of course, is one of the exciting parts of being up here on board and being an astronaut. There are things about it that make life hard, though. Obviously, when you lose something, you can go floating away in any direction. So, you know, if you lose your keys on Earth, you'll lose stuff up here uh, even more often and I've proved that to be true. But it will take that, um, you know, obviously it, it lends itself to sort of a fun life up here. But even more importantly, it lends itself to all the amazing experiments that we can do on board that take advantage of that microgravity environment to do things that we can't do on Earth but that can benefit uh, life back on Earth. I'm Leela, a 14-year-old from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, I had a question. How do you keep track of time on the space station? 
Well, it's interesting because we do have 16 sunrises and sunsets every day. And that's because we orbit around the Earth about every hour and a half. So as you can imagine, we can't keep track of time just kind of by keeping track of whether or not it's night or day. But luckily the ground, uh, our ground centers in Houston, our team teams on the ground that keep us busy all day, they make sure that we don't lose track of time because we have a schedule that actually, actually keeps us doing different tasks down to the five minute increment. So we we pick a arbitrary time to follow on the Earth. So we could really pick any time zone because we're obviously orbiting around the Earth up above all the time zones. But we pick one that is a good sort of halfway point between all of the different centers on the Earth that we work with. So we work on a daily basis with um, grounds teams in Moscow, Houston, Japan, Europe. And so we actually pick what's called Greenwich Mean Time, which is a time um, in sort of the Central European area. And that is what we call our regular time. We're about probably seven hours ahead of you guys out there in uh, New Mexico. But like I said, the ground keep team keeps us nice and busy. So we, we don't have the luxury of losing track of time. I'm Ava, and I'm nine years old. I'm Maya, and I'm seven years old. How do you sleep? Is a space station crew sleep. member always awake? Great questions. Um, the first one, how do we sleep? So interestingly, we use a sleeping bag, similar to what you might use when you go camping, except we can put it on any surface. So I can sleep what you might think of as standing up, or I could sleep on the ceiling like this. And in fact, my bedroom in space is actually in the ceiling. But once we're zipped up inside our sleeping bag, which actually has holes so that our arms can float like this, all you have to do is just close your eyes and you fall asleep. It's actually very comfortable sleeping. I sleep great up here. Um, no hot spots, you know, no um, covers getting in the way. It's just extremely comfortable. Now, we do not run 24-hour operations here where we have someone awake at all times. During the night, we all, all the astronauts on board, all six of us, get to sleep at the same time and we count on our ground teams to keep an eye on things and all the systems on board and they would wake us up with a an audio call or the station's self-monitoring system would wake us up with an alarm if there was something that needed attention. So luckily we get to sleep all together um, and that kind of keeps us all in sync. Hi, I'm Haley Peterson and a seventh grader from Albuquerque Academy. Hi, I'm Anna Bella and I'm nine years old. What is your daily routine? Our daily routine is a lot like many on the ground. Uh, get up, you know, have some breakfast, get, get yourself ready, maybe say hi to your crewmates. Our commute is a little different though. There's no cars. We, we just basically get to float on over to the next module over and then suddenly we're already at our jobs. Work throughout the day, little lunch break, and then in the evenings after work, uh, we usually have time for a little a little free time, a little time to spend together and uh, call home, call our families. So it's a pretty standard uh, day like you might think of at home, just like your parents do, going to work. Hi, I'm Daniel, and I am 12 years old. Hi, I'm Eli, I'm 10 years old. I was wondering, how differently does food taste in space? And is the food you eat different than what you would eat in space on Earth? Wow, what great questions. So first of all, the food is different, but I don't think it tastes that different. For the most part, I think I would say that we taste about the same. There are some changes you could say. I would say up here, people tend to like spicier foods. Um, but in general, I like the same foods up here that I like at home. So speaking of some of those foods, I brought a couple to show you. So all of our food comes in packets, as you can see here, and it's either dehydrated or it's kind of like an MRE style where it's been what they call thermostabilized. So it can live in this packet for a long time and be opened and eaten at any time. Now my favorite one to show people is the dehydrated space hamburger. So yes, we have burgers in space, but not what you might be used to. 
if we open this package up, you can see a dehydrated space burger. So what we would do is we would hook this packet up to a little water dispenser, fill it with hot water and allow it to rehydrate for a little while. And then, you know, add your regular burger toppings and there, there you go. So I actually think that cooking in space is really nice because the preparation is pretty quick. Hi, I'm Ellie and I'm 11. We have many people who jump rope in the audience. Can you break the current world record of a set tumble under? Seven rope revolutions in one jump on the space station? Wow, a septuple under. I am so glad you explained what that was because I can't even fathom someone doing that in Earth, much less up here. I do do a little tiny bit of jump roping with my sister sometimes, but as you can see, we uh, don't have a lot of room for that here. So though I would love to take on your challenge, I'm a little bit afraid of what I might break in the process, not only on the space station, but maybe even on myself. So I'm going to say that we probably could, mainly just because to jump, I can stay in the air for a pretty long time. But uh, these experiments around here aren't exactly uh, made for jump rope being sadly but i'm glad to hear that you guys are and i hope that you have some great jump rope competitions coming up hi i'm sienna a seventh grader at the public academy for performing arts what did it feel like when you were outside the station for the first all woman spacewalk Well, the opportunity to do a spacewalk is one of the most exceptional things I've ever had the honor to do and the privilege to do. And they are all really exciting and offer you amazing views of Earth. They offer you, you know, this professional opportunity to give back to the program by repairing or upgrading something on the outside of space station. So it's really an amazing feeling. That spacewalk where Jessica and I got to do the first one um, as the all-female spacewalk was especially important to me and I think to her as well because we had you know spent our whole lives being inspired by people who showed us what it was like to pursue your dreams and then to be out there and to know that we were able to give back and to perhaps provide that inspiration for people on the ground that to me was just the most amazing feeling that I had during the spacewalk. Hi, I'm Zen Menendez. How do you spend your free time on the space station? And how much time do you have? Well, as I mentioned, yes, we do have some free time. Um, typically on the weekends after work, um, we don't have a ton of time because we do have 12 hour work days. But when we have the time, this is really my favorite thing to do is photography. We have a beautiful window that looks down on the Earth, and I call it the bay window of Space Station, but it's a module called the cupola. And from there, you can just see absolutely phenomenal views um, as we orbit the planet. And this is an 800 millimeter lens that I like to use to capture scenes and uh, different phenomenon on the Earth. So I'm a big fan of photography up here. I also like night photography. When we're not doing stuff like that, we like to hang out together, maybe do some group meals, call home, uh, chat with our friends and family that are home, and, you know, maybe watch movies, stuff like that, um, when, when we just need a little downtime and some recharge time. I also like to read, so there's plenty to do up here, and um, I'm sure we could fill a lot more free time if we had it. Wow. Thank you so much, Christina Cook, aboard the International Space Station, here talking with all of these students at the University of New Mexico. Everybody, can we give her a big round of applause? Thank you so much. It was my pleasure to be with you. Stay tuned. This is Houston ACR. That concludes our event as we count down to 20 continuous years of humans living and working on the International Space Station. Thank you to all
participants from the University of New Mexico. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications. Thank you. 